So I am at my favorite place in all of England. It is sitting here next to the ashes of the great Herbert Spencer. So I really want to say a few things about him. Uh, Herbert Spencer was a contemporary of Charles Darwin. He's the guy that coined the phrase survival of the fittest. Uh, Darwin was a huge fan of Spencer. Um, twice he said some very nice things. One time he wrote to Spencer and he said that he referred to him as 20 times my superior. And another time he, he wrote, he said, everyone with eyes to see and ears to hear ought to bow their knee to you. And I for one do. So again, that's pretty big coming from Darwin. And um, now Herbert Spencer was really like the first guy to really try to explain how the entire world works using a simple evolutionary like paradigm. Uh, he had been thinking in evolutionary ways and I think even using the terminology, the words like evolution long before Darwin. I think it wasn't until like the seventh edition of Darwin's Origin of Species where he started using like the word evolution itself. And um, I think today with the discoveries of, of things like epigenetics, and so on you know the way people look at evolution is changing a little and uh, it, it, it gives it makes it even more uh, Spencerian and uh, now also if you are a libertarian uh, Murray Rothbard he referred to Spencer's work uh, social statics he referred to it as the greatest uh, libertarian political treaties ever written I mean, so that right there coming from Murray Rothbard is already, you know, amazing. Now, one of the very interesting things about this particular grave is that, again, Herbert Spencer, a tremendous intellect of freedom and free markets and libertarianism and so on. So his grave is right here, right next to me. But just a few feet, you just turn around. That is the grave, obviously, of Karl Marx. So... It's just amazing how these two graves ended up being so close together. And even though one is an intellectual of just how the entire universe works, and I will talk a little bit more about that, and then we have Karl Marx who just made a gigantic error. And it really reflects much of what is wrong with the world. Here we have just one lonely, woke-ass fuck libertarian. <clears throat> and uh, every few minutes you get a nice little crowd of people getting around Karl Marx. So I want to say a few more things about Herbert Spencer. Um, if you're a libertarian, first, like, mankind eventually stumbles upon some ideas, upon some truths. Like, sooner or later mankind was going to stumble upon the fact that the earth goes around the sun, that the earth spins around its own axis, and so on. So sooner or later, if the Israeli-Palestinian disaster does not lead to, like, the destruction of humanity you know sooner or later mankind is going to stumble upon how the economy how the social economic order has evolved and how it's built and so on and uh, and when it does if there is a simple evolutionary way that explains the entire thing then sooner or later mankind is going to start looking back and people like Herbert Spencer will become better known like today why, why is it that most of us you know who are learned you know have heard of Charles Darwin because he stumbled upon evolution and natural selection and, and so on. Why do most of us know, you know, Francis, you know, Watson and Crick? Because those are that is the brains where where finally these ideas, you know, got together that help explain DNA. So the same thing is going to happen. If an evolutionary understanding of how the entire world works eventually, you know, comes to be seen as how the world really works, then people like like Spencer will be much more famous than they currently are and the same applies to someone like like Friedrich Hayek obviously so now so Spencer in the in the world of libertarianism of Austrian economics especially uh, if you're a fan of Austrian economics especially a lot of people that have become so thanks to the Ron Paul revolution and all that uh, and you follow, you know, in Austrian economics you have people like Louis van Mises, Friedrich Hayek, and so on. So if you are familiar with that world, uh, you know that the Austrian school of economics, oh, well, 
here we have this is what I'm talking about right here we got we waited a few more minutes and now we got a nice little crowd here forming and uh, this guy more people but uh, so so Carl Manger if you follow Austrian economics you know that Carl Manger is really regarded as kind of like the founder of the school of you know that school of thought and Carl Manger he's known for making a at least a couple of big like breakthroughs so he was one of the subjectivists you know the one of the people who said well you know value is subjective that's where we get the value from it's all you know, value really comes from the particular brains that are doing the valuation and not things don't get their value from the labor theory of value you know Karl Marx you know so again value is subjective and so on but the other <clears throat> big contribution by Karl Menger was his explanation for the evolution of money and social institutions. Now, if, if you're going to try to understand how the social economic order works, you have to, at some point, you have to explain the evolution of money. And, uh, and, and that is key. So whenever some philosopher or some economist or someone is trying to like, you know, write a book or something about how the entire world works, and something along those lines uh, something like money which is vital you know to the emergence of society like discussed and it has to be discussed properly and that is why anybody attempting to explain how the entire world works you know you have to reference Menger you have to you know go through Menger so now uh, Karl Menger was able to explain I'm not gonna get into like the evolution of money but he was able to make this break you know to explain how money is like many other social institutions like governments themselves oh, here now the crowd is really like picking up right see yet not a single one of these people <laughs> you know have paid any attention to Herbert Spencer's grave but anyway so my point is that uh, Karl Menger you know he knew that things like money governments law religion uh, states right those are things that are the result of human action but not of conscious human planning or design. And, uh, and he knew that they sort of came about through a certain like evolutionary process. Now I'm gonna stop right there and when, when we look at like life or, or order, right? In order for you to have life, uh, you need knowledge, you need information. When we look at the world of like living things, we, we have a pretty good understanding how that works. D DNA is really like this molecule that stores information. And uh, we have the process of natural selection, we have competing DNA, competing genes, and then natural selection selects, you know, if, if those living things are able to, to grow and divide and, you know, and spread, uh, then those genes that have the superior information, they get to spread, you know, through time. And that is the mechanism that, that discovers superior knowledge, superior genes, which are able to sustain order. So if you're going to have order, you know, order doesn't just sustain itself at random. It needs precise information. And that is what biological evolution, you know, via genetics, you know. So you, one could say that natural selection sort of discovered a mechanism of creating order. And that is mechanism, has DNA, you know, and so on. But once you get to to tribal man, right? Now if we look at society in general, we have something else. We have the entire global economy. We have what Herbert Spencer himself referred to as the social organism, okay? So we went from having the biological organism to having the social organism. If you look at society, you know, from above, you know, like a Google Maps, it's, it really is like a living thing. You know, you have all of this knowledge spreading. You have this like mini human ant farm. You have the banking and lending industries. You have manufacturing here. You have all those things. You have, you know, the whole thing. When we look at biology, we can see that the social, that, that living things uh, are coordinated by many systems. We have the circulatory system, the respiratory system. We have the Krebs cycle. We have all of these, you know, complex systems, but we clearly know that they were not designed by anyone, right? You know, the human body is a collection of trillions of cells. It is the, the result of the actions of trillions of cells, but we know that it's not the result of any conscious design or planning on the part of the cells. We know that natural selection has evolved all of these mechanisms that make all these things happen. Now, similarly, in the social organism, you know, 
we have something similar. We have economic competition, profit and loss calculation, interest rate coordination, the way the banking and lending industries work, how competition spreads knowledge through society. I mean, if you look at society in general, uh, every brain is like a small computer, right? Everyone is trying to innovate to come up with a superior idea. Like BMW or whoever, you know, some auto manufacturers, they come up with like the power windows. So that's a great idea. And once they come up with a good idea, economic competition motivates and forces all the other auto manufacturers into copying the superior knowledge. So we can see how economic competition is this mechanism that motivates the creation of superior knowledge and it spreads that knowledge throughout the social order. Now that is just one mechanism, economic competition. You have things also like interest rate coordination. Uh, for example, thanks to like interest rates and the banking and finance industry, you can look at every single brain, every entrepreneur as having like ideas, right? If your idea is really good, right, then you can borrow money. You can borrow like a, a billion dollars at 10%, carry out your super awesome idea that might have a return investment of like 50%. Right? So you borrow money, you carry out your wonderful idea, which really grows the economic pie a lot, then you pay back the loan with interest, and great, you, know, you made the economic pie bigger. But thanks to interest rates, you have two types of brains. You have brains that have superior ideas, and they become the borrowers, and they execute you know, their wonderful plans. And you have minds that have inferior ideas, right? The people that don't know what to do with their money or their savings. So those people refrain from consumption. Right? And they leave the wealth in the economic pie so that the borrowers can then borrow that wealth and execute their superior plans. So, so what the banking and lending industry and interest rates does, you, know, you can see how, how wealth goes from brains that have inferior knowledge and it, and it gets moved into the brains that have superior knowledge, allowing the social order to like restructure itself you know, in ever you know, more profitable, more more pie increasing ways so, so again i briefly just mentioned how economic competition is this wonderful mechanism you see now there we go another nice little crowd nice right there you go again still nobody paying attention you know to herbert spencer <laughs> so anyways I, I briefly discussed two mechanisms right economic competition and interest rate coordination that greatly help society um, you know, kind of like coordinate this massive human ant farm, the, what Herbert Spencer referred to as the social organism, right? So now th this system, economic competition, interest rate coordination, what it does for the economy, and many other economic things like profit and loss calculation and other things, again, these things, they are the result of human action, but not of conscious human planning or design. No, no smart group of monkeys a long time ago or, you know, or people a couple of thousand years ago, they say, oh, I'm going to invent money so we can have trade, easy trade. And then we're going to have economic competition, create this wonderful benefit where knowledge is going to be created and spread throughout society. We're going to have a banking system where we're going to have interest rates that is, are going to coordinate and put wealth in the brains to have the best ideas. No, 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 no. Just like in biology, right, cells are inadvertently part of massive, complex human bodies, the same thing happens in the social order, you know? And uh, so what this, what I'm trying to explain here, this is the kind of thinking, this evolutionary sort of thinking that people like Herbert Spencer were the pioneers, you know, in trying to explain how the entire world is the result of an evolutionary uh, process. And uh, so back to Karl Menger. So Karl Menger was you know, the guy, like the founder of the Austrian school, who really understood how money, you know, and all the benefits that arise from it, you know, arose via this, like, uh, evolutionary process. And when you look at Menger's writings, one can see just how influential Herbert Spencer was, even in helping start the so-called Austrian school, because if you look at Menger's, like, second book, uh, Met you know, studies into the methodological sciences or whatever, I, f I forgot the title. It's like thoroughly grounded on Spencer's thinking. Spencer's evolutionary views really had a tremendous impact in the, in the late 1800s. And you can see the titles of the sections. So you see the little crowd is getting bigger. We got more, 
more fans of the kami. Right. So if you look at the at the sections of the titles, it was like, you know, I forgot the names of the titles, but you can see that they were all full of like references to like biology, you know, and uh, and making comparisons. This sort of comparison between biology and the social the social organism, and uh, Menger refers to Spencer twice. You know, I I don't think he mentioned that many people, but twice he refers to Herbert Spencer. One time, you know, I think favorably both times. One time he was referring to some kind of like research that Herbert Spencer was trying to do. He was trying to collect all this information and so on. So the point I want to make is that, that you know, it, it, to some degree, you know, it, it was Herbert Spencer played a huge role in getting Carl Menger to think in this evolutionary way so he can really explain the evolution of money. And then if we, if we fast forward, obviously Carl Menger was a big time evolutionary thinker and so was Ludwig von Mises. And then obviously you get Friedrich Hayek, who is like, I mean, to me, Hayek, I mean, as incredible as Herbert Spencer was. I mean, I can't see how anyone could have done such an incredible job at trying to piece together how the whole world works, you know, as Spencer did, you know, given what he had. But then Hayek came in the 20th century and he's the guy that really just like finished the whole thing. And it's important to note that, that Hayek himself, since he was such an evolutionary thinker, he himself thought that the Austrian school, that people like Mises and, you know, some of the guys that came in between, that they were not, like, evolutionary enough, you know. Uh, Hayek himself said that, that that was, like, the key. He, he, th he thought that the evolutionary way of looking at things, you know, went from Menger. He said that I myself, how you know, he said it, but, but the evolutionary thinking aspect of the Austrian school, you know, had been kind of, like, skipped. And he felt like it was really strong within Menger, but it wasn't until, he, he said, it wasn't until I came along, you know, that the, the evolutionary paradigm really got, like, solidified again. Again, I am totally, like, butchering his words, but, uh, so anyways, that's it about Spencer.